Hello, anatomy colleagues. This is Dr. Alsip, and I am very excited to talk some basics and clinically important aspects of the muscles of the anterior neck. And these muscles will include the large rope-like sternocleidomastoids and the smaller strap-like infrahyoid muscles, which are a bit more in the midline. Starting with the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which sometimes we abbreviate and you'll see often as SCM, sometimes we even say SCM. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle um, is going to be a very prominent landmark in the neck, one that you can actually see pretty well through the skin and one you can definitely palpate on yourself. So just looking at the location, as you can see here in red, try to palpate the sternocleidomastoids on yourself. And I think you'll find them pretty easy to locate, particularly if you kind of tilt your, um, or kind of twist your face to the side. The fact that it's so easy to palpate is the reason this muscle is used to subdivide the neck into, excuse me, into an anterior, um, kind of more the anterior cervical region, which will be on this side of the sternocleidomastoid, and then the posterior cervical region will be um, on the posterior surface and behind, or more posterior to the sternocleidomastoid. There are two superior attachments. The mastoid process of the temporal bone, which is kind of right in this region, if you place your fingers right under your ear, uh, you will feel a bump, and that bump will be the mastoid process. And the muscle's attachments will continue from the mastoid process posteriorly along the occipital bone. So the occipital bone is that posterior part of the skull. And there are two inferior attachments as well, but these are a bit more separated or distinct than what you have post or uh, superiorly. There will be the clavicular attachment, as you can see right here, uh, along the collarbone or your clavicle. And a more medial attachment, as you can see right here where I'm underlining, on the top part of the sternum, the sternum is your breastbone right here in the midline region, um, and the top part of the sternum is called the manubrium. And you can see this muscle is crossing multiple cervical vertebral joints, basically all of them. So it um, will most directly affect actions at these joints. So let's talk a little bit about these actions. If both sternocleidomastoid muscles are contracting, so say, so both the left and the right are contracting or bilateral contraction, quite a few things can happen. Um, but the main action we are going to focus on is flexion of the vertebral vertebrae, AKA neck flexion. So this is where the chin um, would start to, it, you would flex or kind of bend down and it would get close to um, the more distal or inferior attachments, so close to that manubrium. So kind of bend, kind of think putting your chin to your chest. If only one sternocleidomastoid muscle is contracting or unilateral contraction, there will be lateral flexion of the neck on the contracting side. So say the right, this is the right side, this is the left side, so kind of patient uh, right and left. Um, the right sternocleidomastoid is contracting, the head will tilt to the right side, so kind of heading towards that right shoulder region. And rotation can occur as well, with the head turning kind of superiorly towards the opposite side. So in this case of the right sternocleidomastoid muscle contracting, the face would rotate to the left. So kind of think putting your, your uh, head on your shoulder and kind of tilting your chin up, that would be this action, the action described right here. The innervation of SCM is unique in that one nerve does not have both afferent and efferent fibers, which is the case for most innervation of muscles. Usually we describe one nerve that innervates a muscle and it has both afferent and efferent fibers. Instead, for the sternocleidomastoid, there are separate nerves providing efferent or motor innervation and afferent or sensory innervation. And this uh, accessory nerve, which will be the efferent innervation, is our first introduction into a cranial nerve. It is cranial nerve 11. Each pair of cranial nerves will have a name and a number associated with it. 
And the accessory nerve is entirely efferent, so it couldn't provide sensory innervation if it tried. So SCM will only, um, so the, sorry, the accessory nerve will only provide motor innervation to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the SCM will have to get its afferent fi fibers or innervation from uh, fibers from the cervical spinal nerve C2 and C3. So the fact that there are two separate um, types of nerves innervating this muscle is unique in terms of muscle innervation. One last thing I want to mention about sternocleidomastoid before we move on is that this vein right here, as you can see in this image, that runs just superficial and obliquely over the muscle. And this is the external jugular vein. This image only had it labeled as jugular vein, and I added the uh, the appropriate external, because there is an internal jugular vein. The EJV, as we like to call it, so we like to shorten things sometimes. So the EJV uh, is the most dominant superficial vein of the anterior neck. And the visibility of the external jugular vein can serve as a slightly kind of visible gauge of venous pressure. If venous pressure is normal, the EJV is typically only visible a little bit above the clavicle, whereas if venous pressure is uh, kind of risen, the vein becomes considerably more prominent and visible sometimes throughout its entire length. Okay, moving to the infrahyoid muscles, or the strap muscles, as you may hear them referred to, as they are said to resemble straps or ribbons. There are four pairs of muscles. Two are going to be superficial, so that will be uh, the sternohyoid, as you can see right here, and the omohyoid, which I actually think you can see better here, which will extend all the way to the scapula. And there will be two uh, sets of deep strap muscles. These will be the sternothyroid and um, the thyrohyoid, which will be the more um, superior one. As the name infrahyoid would suggest, all the muscle bellies will be located inferior to the hyoid bone, which is that kind of floating bone in the anterior neck. It's not really floating. It doesn't directly articulate with any other bones, but it very, has very close um, attachments to muscles and some ligaments. So um, it will not, so that all these muscles will be inferior to the hyoid and all but one will actually have an attachment on the hyoid. And the great thing about these names of these muscles are they tell you exactly where they attach. So the sternohyoid would attach on the sternum and the hyoid, whereas say the thyrohyoid would attach on the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid. You can kind of go from there. Now, based on the location of the muscles and attachments, it can become kind of intuitive as to what these muscles do when they contract. And mainly, <clears throat> they serve to depress or lower the hyoid um, when they contract. Or, also importantly, they can just keep the hyoid bone steady to allow for specific actions like swallowing and speaking to occur efficiently. If a muscle has an attachment on the thyroid cartilage of the larynx, it can play a role in either elevating, like the thyrohyoid, or depressing, as with the sternothyroid um, muscle, the, the larynx, because that thyroid cartilage is of the larynx. Most of the infrahyoid muscles are innervated by the beautifully named ansa cervicalis, which I'm going to kind of outline here on this image, which is this kind of delicate loop of nerve that will um, be derived from the cervical plexus. The ansa cervicalis is closely associated with the carotid sheath, which covers uh, many of the larger and deeper neurovascular structures of the neck, like the common carotid artery, as you can see here, or the internal jugular vein, not the external jugular vein, that's more superficial, um, but the internal jugular vein. Now, peeking right through this region right here, you can see a little bit of the thyroid gland. And I hope you notice that there are some infrahyoid muscles. In fact, all the infrahyoid muscles, to some extent, will cover the thyroid gland. 
So in cases where a surgeon needs access to the thyroid or any of its associated neurovasculature, such as in like a thyroidectomy, the infrahyoid muscles often need to be moved or resected to gain access to those deeper structures. So that should wrap us up regarding the muscles of the anterior neck, and here is our summary slide for this learning objective. Please make sure to review this material and ask questions if there are any areas that need some clarification. Thank you for your time and attention, and have a great rest of your day.